right, our third case uh, will be presented by Dr. Erin Kenning uh, from the Surgical Residency at Penn State, and we're happy to have her here joining us today. And she's going to present a case of a type 3 endo leak uh, due to material fracture. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Erin uh, Kenning. I'm a general surgery resident at Penn State Hershey Medical Center. Uh, I'd like to thank you for sticking around and allowing us to present the case of a type 3B endo leak. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All done. Perfect. Uh, I have no disclosures. So since its introduction in the 1990s, endovascular abdominal aortic aneurysm repair has provided physicians a less invasive way to treat these aneurysms. It's provided countless patients the opportunity to prevent the significant mortality risk associated with aneurysm rupture without the attendant risks and challenges associated with open standard, uh, standard open repair. Multiple well-conducted trials have established the role of EVAR relative to conventional repair. From the EVAR 1 and 2 trials to the DREAM and Eurostar trials and beyond, uh, the evidence supporting endovascular AAA repair continues to grow. As we know, there are a number of stent grafts available for use with no overall survival advantage of one design compared to any other when appropriately selected for various reasons from patient anatomy, cost, surgeon preference um, among the various reasons. Clearly, there's no one-size-fits-all device. And despite the growing role of EVAR, there are a whole array of potential challenges from local issues such as access site problems to device-related complications in situ to more systemic issues such as contrast-induced nephropathy, radiation exposure, and the need for ongoing follow-up and surveillance. Continuous surveillance of the endograft is critical to identify endoleaks. And there are several different types of endoleaks as seen here. Uh, certainly some endoleaks require urgent re-intervention, uh, whereas others are typically self-limited and will resolve spontaneously. Of these different types of endoleaks, I'll be discussing a relatively rare type of endoleak, the 3B endoleak, which represents an actual tear in the fabric. So we first met this 64-year-old patient in 2007 when he presented with abdominal pain and a large, tender, pulsatile abdominal mass. A representative CT scan image is shown with findings of an 8.4 centimeter abdominal aortic aneurysm and evidence of rupture, as seen here, with stranding of the periaortic, uh, uh, periaortic tissue. Excuse me. At exploration, the patient was found to have a contained rupture of a large abdominal aortic aneurysm. He underwent repair with an 18 millimeter Dacron tube graft. The aneurysm was noted to be infrarenal and his IMA was found to be chronically occluded. Postoperatively, the patient did uh, or developed some new onset atrial fibrillation, but otherwise did well and was discharged to home on postoperative day eight. The patient was seen in routine follow-up to follow some mild enlargement of his femoral and popliteal arteries. But throughout this time, his only complaint was really that of a mildly symptomatic incisional hernia, which showed no signs of incarceration. However, in 2012, five years after his initial repair, an abdominal duplex revealed a 5.3 centimeter aneurysm of the bifurcation extending into the proximal right common iliac artery just distal to the repair. CTA corroborated this new finding in distal aortic anastomotic pseudoaneurysm secondary to dehiscence of the distal aortic suture line was suspected. Therefore, in October of 2012, the patient underwent endovascular repair with a one-piece unibody bifurcated graft with a 28 millimeter proximal main body diameter and 16 millimeter diameter by 40 millimeter il length iliac limbs. The main body uh, landed in the Dacron tube graft proximally. The initial aortogram shown here shows the large distal anastomotic pseudoaneurysm. And the completion arteriogram shows the placement of the endograft.
Note here that you can see the contrast extends outside of the stents, which is normally seen in this particular device where the fabric is not adhering to the stents except at the proximal and distal attachment points. In surveillance six weeks postoperatively, the patient only complained of his incisional hernia from the open AAA repair. Surveillance CT showed no recurrence of the distal aortic pseudoaneurysm with the endograft in good position. You can see in the CTA the endograft is in good position and there's no recurrence of the pseudoaneurysm. In June of 2013, he was seen in follow-up, again only complaining of his incisional hernia. Surveillance CT scan, however, showed recurrence of the pseudoaneurysm. Here you can see in the CTA contrast extending back into the pseudoaneurysm cavity, consistent with some type of endoleak. And so in looking at the CT scan, we could see that the right limb of the endograft had lost its seal. Here's a representative image from the CT scan showing the right limb of the graft has separated from the medial wall of the right common iliac artery. An arteriogram was performed showing the wall of the stent, oh, there we go, uh, showing the right, uh, showing the wall of the stent as outlined in black was not opposed to the vessel wall as outlined in red. Uh, so the right iliac limb was angioplasty to better oppose it to the wall of the vessel. Follow-up arteriography, however, showed that the endoleak persisted. So then we inserted a balloon into the right limb, the endograft, which showed persistence of the endoleak when there was no flow down the right limb. And so what we were left with, with was what appeared to be a type 3B endoleak. Knowing that type 3B endoleaks are quite rare, we chose to proceed with a dynamic CT scan to be sure that what we were truly dealing with was a type 3B endoleak. Uh, to the left here is an AP image where you can see IV contrast exiting the graft as a jet, which was pretty unlikely to represent simply the fabric billowing out from the stent. And to the right, the lateral view essentially shows the same type 3B endoleak. And so in November of 2013, the patient underwent endovascular repair of the aortic aneurysm with a modular graft landing just below the renal arteries in the native aorta, just below the initial Dacron graft, with distal attachment sites in the common iliac arteries distal to the previously placed endovascular graft. And here's a completion angiogram demonstrating good proximal seal and no evidence of an endoleak. In summary, the patient underwent open AAA repair in 2007 with a Dacron tube graft. He presented five years later with a distal anastomotic pseudoaneurysm and underwent relining with an aortoiliac unibody stent graft with initial success, but subsequent imaging showed recurrence of the pseudoaneurysm. Initially, this was thought to be due to a type 1B endoleak, so he underwent balloon angioplasty of the right iliac extension. Subsequently, after a series of diagnostic studies confirming a type 3B endoleak, his entire infrarenal aorta and bilateral common iliac arteries were relined with separate endovascular aneurysm repair device. And it's worth noting that in February of 2014, only after confirmation of obliteration of the endoleak and recurrent pseudoaneurysm, the patient finally underwent repair of what was actually symptomatic throughout the whole time, his incisional hernia. Here are two representative CT scan images uh, showing a before and after of the incisional hernia repair. Note here that the pseudoaneurysm has now been excluded and the hernia has been repaired with PTFE mesh reinforcement. And here's a CT reconstruction showing an intact endovascular repair with no evidence of an en ongoing endoleak and further interval decrease in the size of the aneurysm sac. So as previously mentioned, there exist a number of well-conducted trials touting the benefits of EVAR. However, with any evolving te technology, there's been an almost directly proportional increase in anecdotal reports of complications. 
Type 3B endoleaks, for example, have been reported in the literature in various prostheses, however infrequently. Whereas the overall incidence of type 3 endoleak has been reported to be between 0.7 to 7 percent, type 3B endoleak or fabric defect remains much less common than even type 3A endoleak, that is, disconnection of the graft components. This complication also seems to be device dependent. In a poster presented at the 2015 European Congress of Radiology, Porterman et al. found that type 3 endoleaks were significantly more common in first and second generation endografts relative to third generation endografts. Moreover, among their small sample of type 3 endoleaks, the incidence of 3B endoleaks occurred much less commonly than type 3A endoleaks, with a greater discrepancy in the newer models, as you can see. However, we have yet to identify a period of particular vulnerability to type 3B endoleaks in these patients. In, a meta, in this meta-analysis, combined re-intervention-free survival after EVAR was found to be 94% and 81.5% at one and five years, respectively. They showed median and interquartile Kaplan-Meier estimates from 14 trials of re-intervention-free survival here and know that no specific time was found at which graft material failure occurred with greater frequency relative to any other time within the period. So it behooves a physician to continue long-term follow-up in order to monitor these repairs. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Hahn, Dr. Tomasco, as well as the Division of Vascular Surgery at Penn State Hershey Medical Center. Thank you for your time and attention.